the Bible. Is it hard to understand? When it comes to reading the Bible, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that this is the Word of God. The seals have been broken, and the truth is here. And when we go throughout the scriptures, when we go throughout extra biblical records, we find that the language that God employed, that he used to create the heavens and the earth, was the Hebrew language. Christ said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But yet no one, no religious leader, no religious church out there anywhere can now identify the 12 tribes of Israel. Can we? God is quite simple, but it seems as if man makes understanding him hard. What are those mysteries? The truth of your book. And the truth will make you free. The Hebrew and Bible Academy, you're invited. Okay, Shalom family. Before we get started, let's first make sure you all can hear us and see us nice and clearly. And once that's established, we'll get right into this week's Sabbath lesson. But first, we want to make sure everything is good so that there's no uh, interruptions uh, that will prevent this broadcast from going out. So let's first confirm if we're good. And once you all give confirmation, we'll get started. Okay, we got Elder Dell, Shabbat Shalom, Elder Dell, for confirming that all is clear. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. All right, so without further ado, let's get right into it. This is the Lord's Sabbath, so we're not going to waste any time. Uh, we're going to get right into today's discussion, which we'll probably, we're going to try to go for about an hour. And uh, from there, we'll let you all enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. But before we talk about the end of the lesson, let's first get uh, started and enter into the uh, beginning of this discussion. Um, as you all can see, um, you have myself, Elder Loya, along with Elder Iraq, who is currently filling in for Elder Akarshiar, who, if it be the Lord's will, uh, will be back with us next Sabbath. Um, <clears throat> the topic of discussion, as you all have seen, the title of today's lesson is His Will Be Done. Uh, we're going to deal with this from the scope. In fact, we're going to show you the scope from which uh, we are addressing today's lesson. And uh, hopefully today's lesson will be informative and eye-opening um, to help us deal with some of the questions that we may have as it pertains to our relationship with the Most High, the Most High's relationship with us, um, the Most High... Uh, hearing our prayers and responding to us in a time that we see fit uh, opposed to the time that the Most High sees fit in his time and his will. So while uh, hopefully uh, those inquiries and those questions that you may have had throughout your journey in this faith uh, and more uh, will be answered throughout the process or the course of this lesson. But without further ado, we're going to get into it. LD Iraq, if you can. Uh, please read the introduction, and that will start us off before getting into the scriptures. Okay, oftentimes in understanding the truth, we get our understandings of the Most High crossed with some sort of instant prosperity type doctrine. We get into the spirit of selfishness and start to look at the Most High as if he is supposed to be waiting beside a phone somewhere waiting for our own personal wants in life. When our prayers aren't answered, when and how we want them, we in our minds scorn the Most High and decide to lose faith in Him. It's time to step back into true reality and understand how this works. Absolutely. So hopefully, um, as we go throughout the course of this lesson, we will be able to build upon this understanding of His will being done, opposed to... Um, 
what we may say or what we may call our will and our desires being fulfilled. Um, there's many layers to this, obviously, but I'm going to try our best to simplify uh, what many may can consider this to be a very complex uh, uh, concept or a very concept, uh, a very complex um, um, teaching or understanding. Okay, the Most High responding to our prayers. Uh, when does the Most High respond to our prayers? Uh, uh, why does it seem as if uh, he responds to or sometimes feels like he doesn't respond immediately or at all to some of our requests that we offer up through our prayers? Well, again, hopefully we'll, we can, we're going to try to answer this to the best of our ability uh, through the word of the Most High God. Okay. So if you can, Elder Yorok, let's start off in the book of 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read verses number 14 as well as 15. 1 John 5 and 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Exactly. So the Bible tells us in the book of 1 John 5 that this is the confidence that we have meaning we as believers, as followers of Christ, as believers in the Most High, have in Him, meaning this is the confidence that believers have in the Most High, that if we ask anything according to what? To His will. If we ask anything, not according to our desires, not according to what we may see fit in that particular time in which we are asking and we're praying, for whatever it is we're praying for, but if it be according to his will, read on. He heareth us. He heareth us. He hears our prayers. He hears our request. He hears our cries. However, the key is that it must be according to his will. And we're going to expound upon that as far as the will of God and how the will of God played out and was exemplified uh, throughout scriptures in many uh, instances, whether it be the prophets, uh, whether it be the patriarchs, uh, whether it be some of the monarchs, some of the kings of Israel. And above all, um, as it played out with the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who we know as Christ. Okay. But the key point, I want you to read that again, verse number 14. The key point is that we must ask according to his will. And we want to try to drive this home as much as we can. So let's read that again, verse number 14. 1 John 5 and 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. It says that if we ask anything according to his will. So our petitions, our prayers, our cries to the Most High must be in accordance to his will. And if it is according to his will, then he heareth us. Read on. And if we know that he hear us. If we know that he hear us, go ahead. Whatsoever we ask, mm -hmm. we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We know that we have the petitions the petitions that are desired of him. Why? Because whatever we ask is in accordance with his will. So when he hears us and responds to our request, we know that that response that the Most High gives is in accordance to his will. We know that our petitions are desired of him because it is according to his will. Okay? So let's move on. Let's build upon this. And let's give our first example through who we know is one who exemplified what it represented and what it meant to live in accordance with the Most High's will. Okay? And that one is who the world calls Jesus Christ. Let's go on to the book of Matthew chapter 26, verse number 38 through 42. That was uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 14 through 15. We're now moving on to the book of St. Matthew chapter 26, verses number 38 through 42. Matthew 26 and 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. 
tarry ye here and watch with me. Right. So now we know that this is the time, this is the hour in which Christ must fulfill his purpose. Where Christ, well, let's not say his purpose, his will or the most high's purpose, the most high's will. Okay. And we're going to see exactly what that is. Right. But it says that his soul was exceeding sorrowful unto death. So because his soul was exceeding sorrowful unto death, he asked his disciples to tarry with him and to watch with him as he went privately to pray. Read on. Verse 39. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Right. So as Christ prayed privately unto the Father, he asked the Father, if it be possible to let this cup, by cup meaning what the Bible refers to as his passion, by passion meaning his suffering, meaning his torture, meaning his humiliation, and his eventual death by crucifixion. He says, let this cup, Pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In other words, my desire is to find another way to, to go through this. <laughs> That's my desire. My desire is to find a way to fulfill your will, but to get around this part where I must be tortured, I must be lied on, I must be humiliated, and I must suffer Death by the painful means of a crucifixion. Okay, is there another way? However, that's what nevertheless means. However, if this be your will, may your will be done. Now, at this time, I must uh, make this very quick point before getting back on track, because obviously... When reading this story, many people have questions, okay? And before I get to those questions, let me just make this statement. Then I'll get to some of the questions that people may have in regards to this particular uh, uh, request and this prayer that Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? Now, um, one thing we can see here is that Christ, even Christ himself, understood that in his prayer, he could not get around the will of the Most High God. As much as he desired to, as much as he desired not to go through that passion, not to take in, of, of that or partake of that cup of suffering, as much as he did not want to go through that, he still understood that the Most High's will surpassed his desire. Okay? So that's the first thing I want to make clear in the scope of this lesson. Understanding that if Christ understood this, then that's something we must also understand when we're praying to the Most High, that we may have a personal desire. Okay? However, at the end of it, the Most High's will must be done. We may have our request, which we may see fit, which in the scope of things may not be necessarily wrong. Our desire or our our request may not be wrong, okay? May not have any evil intent. However, still, all things must be done in accordance with the Most High's will, okay? But now getting to the questions that many people may have as it pertains to this particular story, okay? Many people will look at this and say, well, according to Scripture, it tells us that Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The Bible tells us that Christ is the Lamb of, without blemish that must be sacrificed for the sins of the world. So if that's the case, if he understood that this was a part of his mission to fulfill, why does it seem as if Christ, at the end of it all, is trying to back out of it? Okay? If he understood that this is his will, why is he praying for the Most High to take this cup away from him? Why is he asking the Most High not to, uh, or requesting that he, sh he, he goes not through or, or does not have to go through this suffering? Okay? 
And to answer that question, that is a very good question for some people, is a very difficult question to answer. But the reality of it is that when we understand the biblical narrative, when we understand Christ according to as the scripture have said, not according to tradition, not according to uh, someone's fallacies, someone's misunderstanding of Christ, or what have you. When you understand him according to as the scripture have said, it becomes very easy to answer this question. And the answer to that question is this. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, two quick scriptures. The book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 9. And we're also going to do the book of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 3. Hebrews 2 and 9. But we see Yeshua, or Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. So Hebrews 2 and 9 starts out by stating that Christ was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? That's an idiom meaning that Christ did not come in angelic form. He came in the form of what? A man, flesh and blood. That's what it means when it says that he was made a little lower than the angels. Okay? So now it's about to expound upon this. Read on. For the suffering of death. For what? For the suffering of death. So he was made a little lower than the angels. He was made in the form of flesh and blood solely for the suffering of death. That same suffering that we're reading about that Christ is praying to avoid in the book of Matthew 26. Okay, so now here's the question. What comes with being made a little lower than the angels? What comes with being made of flesh and blood? What comes with that? Let's see. Crowned with glory. Excuse me. You want yep, go ahead. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That he, for according to the grace of God, may suffer death for every man. Right? Read on. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. So all things are by Christ and for Christ, as it tells us in the book of uh, Colossians, the first chapter in the 17th verse. Read on. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So someone had to suffer in order for us to receive salvation. Okay? And it just so happens that he was the one that had to suffer. But now the question again, why does it seem as if he's trying to back out of something that he knew was his destiny? Well, part of that question was answered from the beginning. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He came in the likeness of flesh and blood, which when you're made in the likeness of flesh and blood, that comes with something, okay? And that something goes back to the sin of Adam. Okay? We're going to touch on that very quickly. But let's read on and let's get some understanding as to why it seems as if he's backing out at the last moment. Or he's having doubts at the last moment. Or fear is coming in in the last moment. Emotions are entering in at the last moment. Why is that the case? Read on. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. So he that sanctifieth is Christ, and they that are sanctified are those such as the apostles, uh, those who would come after the apostles who would be sanctified through Christ's sufferings, would be sanctified through Christ's crucifixion, would be sanctified through Christ's blood. Okay? So he that sancti sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are both one. Read on. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So he is not ashamed to call Peter his brother. Why? Because Peter went through the same sufferings. He's not afraid to call Paul his brother. Why? Because Paul went through the same sufferings. He's not a, a, afraid to call uh, 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 Andrew and, and, and the rest of the apostles, John and, and many of these other men, his brethren. Why? 
because they went through the same sufferings. Not only did they go through the same sufferings, they also, as we're going to read, came in like fashion, meaning they also were made a little lower than the angels. Peter was made a little lower than the angels. Paul was made a little lower than the angels. John, Andrew, Matthew, okay, and the rest of the apostles were made a little lower than the angels, meaning what? They were also made of flesh and blood, okay? So he was not ashamed to call them brethren for those particular reasons. Read on. Hebrews 2 and 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. A quote, I believe, from the book of Psalms. Prophesying Christ, declaring his name unto who? His brethren, the apostles. Go ahead. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. In the midst of the church will I sing praise. Again, a prophecy of Christ, declaring his name, declaring the gospel of God, Unto the apostles, who were the initial recipients of this gospel message, who eventually spread it throughout the, the known world in their time. Okay, read on. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. I and the children which God hath given me. Going back to the book of Isaiah, the 8th chapter. Again, a prophecy of Christ and his apostles referring to the, the apostles as the children that the Most High gave him, which uh, is uh, a fulfillment of what we see in the book of Isaiah 53, where it says that he shall see his seed. Not that Christ had physical children, but his apostles, his disciples, were given unto him like his generation, like his children, like his inheritors. Okay, as, a, as, as children, as natural born children will inherit that which they received of their father, the apostles inherited from Christ the gospel. They inherited the Holy Spirit. They inherited power to cast out devils and to perform miracles from their, let's say, uh, spiritual father, who was Christ. So it says, Behold, I and the children which God have given me. Read on. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. As the children are partakers of what? Flesh and blood. So as the children, as the apostles, as Peter, as John, as Paul, as Thaddeus, as Andrew, were partakers of flesh and blood. Read on. He also himself likewise took part of the same. He also, meaning Christ also, likewise took part of the same. So Christ also was made of flesh and blood. And I'm going to explain why I'm bringing this out in relation to what we read in Matthew 26, where Christ is praying to let this cup pass him. It's going to be clear, but let me first, let's move through the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, because really this is going to help us uh, explain, um, uh, explain clearly uh, what Christ is, is suffering and what he's feeling in that time, knowing that his death was imminent. Not a year from now, not six months from now, not 10 years from now, but that very night, he would be given up. And the next day, he would meet his destiny of death. Okay? So now you, could, you can begin to understand why Christ was, was going through these emotions, coming to grips with his mortality. Because death was at the door. Okay, read on. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So through his death he had the power to destroy him who had the power of death that was the devil. Read on. Hebrews 2 and 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So through his death he had the power to empower those who all their life were afraid of death. Okay? Now they could come through with boldness. Now you see after Christ died, uh, the same Peter uh, that uh, Christ said would deny him three times for the cock crew. Okay? The same Peter who when he was asked or when he was spotted and was, was uh, told that, hey, 
That's one of his disciples. Hey, weren't you with the, the Galilean who claimed that he is the son of God and that he's the Messiah and all these various things? You were with him. You're one of his disciples. And Peter denied him. Why? In fear of death. But that same Peter, after Christ was crucified, started coming through boldly, saying what? We ought to obey God rather than men. Became boldly, was willing to suffer persecution and be beaten and whipped and wrongfully imprisoned. Came boldly unto his death. There's the, the, the tradition of how Peter was crucified. And when he was crucified, stated that he was not worthy to be crucified as his Lord was crucified and therefore requested to be crucified upside down. That's the boldness that Peter came with after the death of Christ. Why? Let's read it again. Verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all in all their lifetime subject to bondage. So because of the fear of death, we were subject to bondage. But after Christ's death, you started to see a whole new different spirit upon the apostles of Christ. They became, uh, initially they were running and they were in, uh, scattered all over the place for fear of what was coming upon them. But after Christ's uh, 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 crucifixion, uh, you started to see them coming through boldly and standing for the gospel and speaking in the face of death. You see Stephen, okay, who in the council of the, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin uh, started to accuse them and tell them uh, of their wickedness and how they are no different than their forefathers who rejected the prophets. Stood boldly in the face of death and looked up and, and said that he seen the glory of Christ as he looked up um, as they were uh, uh, stoning him and looking to, uh, to, to end his life. Okay, that's how bold the apostles were after the death of Christ. Why? Because they knew that Christ had the victory over death. Okay, read on. Hebrews 2 and 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. So Christ did not take on him the nature of angels. Meaning what? He did not come as a spirit. He did not come as an apparition. He did not come as a, a, a flame of fire. As it describes the angels in the, uh, in the book of Psalms 104. Okay. He came as what we call a human being. He came as a son of Adam, flesh and blood, and with that, all of the impurities that come with flesh and blood, fear, emotions, hunger, sickness, okay? All of the things we face in these bodies, Christ also faced, okay? Read on. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Meaning what? He took on flesh and blood. The flesh and blood of the seed of Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, all the way down through King David. Okay. Read on. Verse 17. <clears throat> Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto us his brethren. So in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So as his brethren felt fear, he also felt fear. As his brethren felt temptation, he also felt temptation. As his brethren felt sickness, he also felt sickness. Okay? So it behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. So now he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Okay? Now when it comes to uh, 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 dealing with uh, mercy and grace and empathy, okay, Christ, Christ exhibits that. Why? Because he knows what, it, what it's like to be in this flesh. Okay? That's why I say it's that he became a merciful, that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Why is he merciful? Because he understands what it's like to be in this flesh and have to fight and battle this flesh every day, every minute, every second of your life, you're at war with this flesh. And he understands it. Why? Because he lived it himself. 
Read on. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Mm -hmm. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He himself suffered being tempted. He went mm -hmm. through temptation. Okay. He felt the emotions of fear, stress, doubt, sickness. He went through all of those things. So because of that, going back to Matthew 26, now you can see why he says, let this cup pass me. Okay? Why? Because, hey, he's coming to grips with his mortality. He has the same sufferings that we have. Can you imagine? It's no different than someone uh, being on a uh, uh, death row. Okay? Life in prison. And at the end of that, you must suffer the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate punishment of what? Death. Now, when you're initially going into that prison, let's say you go into that prison at 25 years old and you're sentenced to life uh, and, and capital punishment. Initially, at age 25, you know what your final destiny is, but it may not hit you as strongly as when you're at the last day serving your last time, the day, the night before you, you are to go in for capital punishment. Now it's all coming to you. Now all of those emotions of all of those years are now hitting you at once. Why? Because you know that your death is imminent. Not 25 years from now, not 50 years from now, not a year from now, not six months from now, but within 24 hours, your death is imminent. That's a whole nother level of, uh, of, of fear and stress and anguish. Okay, so it's no different with Christ. He knew that this was his final destiny, but now he's it, it's at the door. The hour has come. Okay, so that's what we're seeing in Matthew 26. Okay, let's get one more very quickly. Is that's it on that? Yeah, what, what point are you? Yep, about? go ahead. Check out this this right here. It said in, in 15 and deliver them through the fear of death were all their lifetime subjects to bondage. Okay, so mm. slavery, different things like that, afraid mm. of death. Mm. How Christianity did a mind trick on me, I'm just going to say real quick. Yeah. Think about it. And some of you may have experienced this. When you were in Christianity, you had the understanding that Christ is half man, half God, basically. Right? Mm. So you're thinking to yourself, every time you were up there messing up, you got these thoughts like, well, listen, I can't be like Christ anyway. He was perfect. He was God. Right? Mm. Mm. So when you came into the truth, that all changed. Right. It's like, wait a minute. He had to go through the same stuff. Right. You know, his mind was, was was dealing with the different problems and it made you actually realize you can be perfect according to the Bible. Exactly. So you're sitting there as a slave even to your sins that whole time, mm, you know? Absolutely. So it's just a heavy scripture here, like, you know, Absolutely. Subject. It brings it to life, right? Because we know that he suffered. In fact, let's read that, that last verse again. I think there's a, just a little bit there's more. There's a little there. bit, yeah. <coughs> verse uh, Hebrews 2 and 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Exactly. That pretty much sums up what you just mm. stated, that now we understand that he was tempted, yet sent not. We have that same power in him to be tempted, but yet sent not. Okay. We have that same power. Okay. And that's the beauty of, uh, of, of Christ's uh, what the Bible calls his passion in the book of Acts, the first chapter, what he suffered. That's the beauty of it, because now we get to see through him, through his example, how we can overcome this sinful nature, this sinful flesh. OK, let's read one more. Uh, the book of Romans, chapter eight, verse three. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Right, so for what the law could not do, meaning what? The law cannot redeem us from death. The law gave us the knowledge of sin. That's what the law did, but it could not redeem us from death. Okay? So God sent his son in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So again, going back to Matthew 26, when people ask that question, 
Now you have an answer. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh and therefore suffered what we suffer in this flesh. The same doubts you have, Christ dealt with those same doubts. The same fears you have, Christ dealt with those same fears. The same temptations you have, Christ dealt with those temptations, yet he overcame, he conquered them. Okay, so when you see him at this point where he's saying, let this cup pass me, understand that he's going, he's going through what we would similarly go through knowing that death is at the door. Death is imminent. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's a whole different spirit. It's one thing where death catches you by surprise. Mm. It's another thing when you know that you're about to die. And there's no escaping it. Okay, so that's what we're witnessing. But getting back to the point, the point, the overall point is that Christ, as he is praying, realizes that even though he has a desire to escape this, still the Most High's will must be done. Even in the face of death, the Most High's will must still be done. So let's go back to... Uh, Matthew 26, and let's pick up at verse number 40. Matthew 26 and 40. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Mm. Watch and pray that ye enter not into, con into temptation. Excuse me. The spirit indeed is willing. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. But the flesh is weak. So really, we could have stayed here. Mm. In this verse, because Christ through that is explaining what? That the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's the flesh that goes through that doubt, that goes through that fear. Okay? But it's through the spirit that we're able to conquer that. As the scripture says that um, the, the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and that the spirit is at war with the flesh. So that's the continual battle that we face every single second of our life. Okay, read on. He went away again, verse 42, the second time and prayed saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So again, he says, if this cup cannot pass, except I drink it, except I fulfill this, thy will be done. I will fulfill this. I will go through this. As hard as it will be, I'm going to go through it. Okay. And who are we to even question why he would uh, 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 have these doubts at this time or have these and face these fears at this time? None of us have experienced the have. Let's get the book of Hebrews uh, 12 uh, and 2 very quickly. None of us have experienced the have of what Christ had to go through being a perfect, sinless man. Okay? We have suffered many things, surely, because... Of wrongdoing or things that we may have done. Okay. But he suffered being sinless. Being humiliated. Being tortured. Beaten and whipped. Smacked and spat on. Okay. Lied upon. False witnesses brought in to lie on him. And at the end of it. Have to, to, to suffer hours long on the cross. And then look to the people. Who, who tortured him and wrongfully accused him. And say forgive them. For they know not what they do. Okay? So to even question why he would uh, uh, not desire to have to go through all of this uh, in itself, to me, is foolishness. None of we, we can't imagine having to go through half of that. And sometimes we are 100% wrong, but still cannot stand when we feel slighted. That we're being, someone is lying upon us. And we're 100% wrong in many cases. And still cannot stand being mistreated. What more someone who did no wrong yet was mistreated. Okay. But uh, let's read that very quickly. 12 and 2. Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto your child, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author, the beginning, and the finish, the finisher of our faith. Read on. Who for the joy that was set before him mm. endured the cross. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. Despising the shame because, yes, he was shamed. Read on. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of and God. And is now sat down on the right hand of the throne of God as the king of kings 
as the Lord of Lords on the right hand of the Father. Read on. For consider him <coughs> that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Look at what he suffered. The contradiction of sinners against himself. Uh, the scripture says in Isaiah 53 that he suffered for our transgressions. Here it is. We're looking at him and saying that he's suffering because of something he did. He's suffering because he's a false prophet. He's suffering because he said that he could destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it. And we know the temple took 46 years to build. That's why he's suffering. He's suffering because he was born of uh, a, a adultery. He's suffering because he's a, a sorcerer and a warlock. That's why he's suffering. That's what we said to ourselves. But the Bible says in the book of Isaiah 53, prophesying of this servant of the Lord, telling us that he suffered for our transgressions and that our sins were laid upon him. That's why he suffered. But yet we sat there pointing fingers, sat there shaking the head and, and hissing, as the scriptures would call it, saying and, and, and telling him that because of his wickedness, uh, this misfortune befell him. This suffering befell him because of something he did. When it was because everything that we did that he suffered. When as far as bringing in false, here it is. This, these are supposed to be men of the law, men of uprightness, men of justice, bringing in false witnesses to accuse a man who did no wrong. How can men of truth or men who are supposed to be of truth Men are supposed to be of the law, bring in false witnesses when the scripture says that you shall not bring a false witness in on a matter. This is the contradiction that Christ had to suffer. Okay, read on. 12 and 3 in the end. Uh, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Lest you be weary and faint in your minds and look at your circumstance and say that you have it so rough, you have it so tough. No one understands what you're going through. OK, before you allow that to sink into your mind, look at the suffering of him that came before you. Look at the one who suffered for you so that you could at least be alive in this time to experience the suffering that you go to. And that's not the downplay the things that we go through. We go through some hellish things in this uh, in this earth, in this captivity. So that's not to downplay it. OK, but understand that someone suffered before you and through him. You have the power and the ability to overcome the things that you are currently suffering. Read on. Ye have not resisted unto blood. Yet, you you me, have yes. not yet resisted <laughs> unto blood. Not saying that you won't eventually yeah. resist unto blood. That's coming. Okay. The resisting unto blood is coming. Like there was a time where the apostles were not resisting unto blood when Christ was with them. Okay. There was a time in which they were teaching there were times in which Christ had to flee and spin out the way, but it's not like at that time that the apostles were suffering unto blood. But once Christ was crucified and once men like Paul was on the scene and, and the Sanhedrin was, was cutting loose on the apostles, then you started to see them suffering unto blood. And many of us in this time, we're going to start to see this, that we're going to suffer unto blood for the gospel's sake, for declaring that you are a believer in the Bible that you're a believer in the creator, that you're a believer in the, the, the word of prophecy, that you're a believer in the only begotten son of God will result in bloodshed. That time is coming. Okay? But it says you have not yet suffered unto blood. Read on. Striving against sin. Striving against sin. Okay? So we, we, we haven't, you know, as much as we suffer... And a lot of what we suffer many times is because of our doing, okay? But we have not yet suffered unto blood, striving against sin. But you know who has? Christ has, okay? So it's foolish when we begin the question, why is he trying to back out what he, what, what he has to go through or what he must go through if he knew that this was his destiny? Well, if you had to face and go through the things that Christ went through, how would you react? What would be your response? Okay. But uh, let's move on. Uh, let's move on to St. John chapter 5, verse uh, 27.
St. John 5 and 27, and have given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Mm -hmm. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming <coughs> in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the son of man, the son of God, who was given the power of life to resurrect and raise from the dead. Go ahead. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. As it is prophesied in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter and the second verse, that the time will come where many will be raised, some unto everlasting life and some unto damnation, everlasting damnation. Okay, so it was prophesied in Daniel, but this would be brought forth through the power that was invested in the Son of Man. Okay, read on. I can of mine own self do nothing as I as I hear, I judge. So I can of my own self do nothing. This is Christ speaking. As I hear, I judge. Read on. And my judgment judgment is just. And Christ's judgment is just. Go ahead. Because I seek not mine own will. Because he seeks not his own will. But the will of the Father which have sent me. But the will of the Father that sent him. Okay. So Christ exemplified what it meant to live in accordance with the will of God. Okay. Let's get some examples of Christ uh, fulfilling the will of God. And what the will of God was for Christ to fulfill Going very quickly to the book of St. John, chapter 6, and I believe it's 38. Let me check. Mm -hmm. That's it? Yes, sir. Let's, get, let's read that very quickly. John 6 and 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will. So I came down from heaven. Again, Christ is telling us that he came not to do his own will. Go ahead. But the will of him that sent me. But the will of him that sent me. And he had to keep reiterating this because the, the wicked of our people, the Jews, <laughs> kept questioning by whose authority was he doing miracles? By whose authority was he teaching? And Christ had to reiterate that I'm not doing my own will. I'm doing the will of the same God that you claim to believe in. Okay, read on. And this is the Father's will. And this is the Most High's will. So this is what the will of God was for Christ to fulfill. Which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. So of all that he hath given me, I shall lose nothing. So of all the elect, that were elected to be of Christ's fold, Christ said that he should lose none. That's the will of God, that none of the elect are lost. Read on. But should raise it up again at the last day. But shall raise it up again at the last day. Why? Because as the Father have life in himself, he have also given life unto the Son. So that what? So that the Son could have the power of the resurrection of life. Christ could now resurrect lost soul or the, the souls who have died in Christ from the dead. He showed an example of that with Lazarus when he raised Lazarus from the dead, showing that he had the power to restore life. Okay. Also, after he was uh, uh, crucified, it, it says that uh, many souls came up who were dead in past times and began to proclaim uh, 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 Christ began to proclaim the gospel, showing us that Christ had the power to resurrect. Why? Because the Most High gave him that power. And it was the Most High's will that he had that power to resurrect those who had in, in past times died in Christ. Okay, read on. Verse 40, and this is the will of him that sent me. So again, Christ is telling us what is the will of the God that sent him. Read on. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him. Everyone that sees the Son and believes on him. Go ahead. May have everlasting life. May have everlasting life. So this is what the Most High's will was as it pertained to Christ. This is what the Most High set out Christ to fulfill. Okay. 
So that's an example, again, of Christ exemplifying what it means to live and to live in and to fulfill the will of God. Now let's move on to the uh, book of Jeremiah 18, verse number one. Jeremiah 18, verse one. The Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, excuse me, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, mm. as seemed good to the potter to make it. Mm. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel. Can I not do with you as this potter? Mm, mm, mm. Read that again from the top, verse 1. Yes, sir. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Jeremiah 18 and 1, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my word. He says, So go to the potter's house, and I will cause thee to hear my word. So in other words, mm. go down to the potter's house, go down to where pottery is made, and come back, and I'll, I'll give you the understanding of my words. So in other words, he wanted Jeremiah to see a living example, okay, of the position the most high held as the potter and the position we held as the potter's clay. Okay, so let's read this. Jeremiah 18 and 3. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. So Jeremiah went to the potter's house and he saw the potter operating, wrought a work on the wheels. In other words, a shaping clay on the potter's wheel. Read on. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Mm. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. So the potter made pottery as it seemed good in his sight. Why? Because as the potter, he has power over the clay to make whatsoever he will. That's the power that the potter possesses over the potter's clay. This is what the Most High wanted Jeremiah to see in real time so that he could come back and understand the word and will of the Most High, with the Most High being the ultimate potter and we being the ultimate potter's clay. Read on. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I, I do with you as this potter? So you mean to tell me that the potter has power over the clay to make whatsoever he will, but yet me being the ultimate creator, me being the ultimate potter, you mean to tell me that I don't have the same pow power to do what I will over my clay? How is that equal? How, do, how does that make sense? How is that balance? How does that make sense? Okay. I'm the potter of, of life itself. And yet I don't have the power as the potter over life itself to do what I will with that life, with that clay. But you respect the fact that the physical potter has power over physical clay to do what he will with his clay. How does that make sense? Read on. Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand. So, <laughs> read, read that again, I'm sorry. Uh, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So the same way you see that potter shaping the clay in his hand, making whatever he sees fit with his hands, working that clay, understand that you are the clay in my hands, hmm. O house of Israel. Therefore, I can do with you whatsoever I will. Okay, read on. 18 and 7, Jeremiah. At what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? So if I want to take this clay, if I want to collapse it, if I want to destroy it and reshape it, it is my will to do so. It is my power to do so. 
if I want to uh, uh, pluck up this nation and pull it down and destroy it, it is my power to do so. Read on. Verse 8. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So if you repent from the evil, the same way the potter saw that that clay was marred and that it needed to be reshaped and rebuilt and restructured for, for good use, I can do the same exact thing with you. Because you, O house of Israel, have been marred through your sins, through your rebellion. Okay? But if you repent of that sin, if you repent of that iniquity, if you repent of that rebellion, I can reshape you so that you can be used for good use. Read on. Verse 9. And at what instant I shall, see, excuse me, shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Exactly. So the same way that potter got the opportunity to shape that clay any way he would like, the Most High has that same power. If you repent, he will use you for good. He will build you and plant you, establish you. But if you do evil, the Most High will collapse you and toss you to the side. Why? Because you're useless. Okay? Let's get another one. Let's get Isaiah 45 and uh, verse number 9 through 12. Okay? Another scripture explaining the power that the Most High has over his creation. Okay? And how... Yep, go ahead. Somebody actually eventually said in the trap chat, and I was, it was killing me to, to think it. Yeah. But to show you how close a dynamic that analogy is, we were made from the dust of the ground. Mm, so right. he's literally telling you to say it's the same exact dynamic. Exactly. We we were just we were essentially a vessel he made from the dust of the ground. Exactly. <laughs> Which is deep within itself to mm. show you that the Most High God, the power of the Most High God, the fact that he would shape his greatest creation, not from uh, thunder and uh, clouds and taking a piece of the sun and taking a piece of the moon and Taking the stardust, mm -hmm. as some people say, we're, we're, we're made of stardust. That's foolishness. <laughs> okay? He didn't take of the, the chief things of creation in order to make his greatest creation. He took of the lowest thing on the earth to make his greatest creation. To do what? To show his power. He took us of the dust of the ground and shaped us and formed us the same way that a potter would take of, of dust and, and shape it and, and make it into something so magnificent. Something so great um, um, uh, for, for the use of mankind. The Most High did that with his greatest creation, not using the greatest things, not using the sun and the moon and the stars and thunder and lightning and all those. He just simply used the dust of the ground, the lowest thing on the earth to create the greatest thing on earth, which is mankind. But uh, uh, um, um, that scripture, Isaiah 45 verses 9 through 12, Isaiah 45 and 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. You see that? <laughs> Woe unto him that, that striveth with his maker. And that's what we're doing when we question the will of the Most High God. When we question the desire of the Most High God. We strive with our maker. The Most High said what? Let the pot shirt let the pot shirt strive with the pot shirts strive with the pot shirts. Now you have a pot which again is shaped of clay, right, and is used for the benefit of mankind. The Most High in our broken state, when we're striving against Him, when we're in rebellion against Him, doesn't even refer to us as a full pot. He refers to us as a pot shirt, which is a broken piece of a pot. He said, you potsherds argue and strive with the potsherds, but don't strive with me, okay? Because I am the maker. I am the former of the pot, okay? So you have no authority to argue with me or to continue uh, contend with me or strive with me, okay? Read on. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, what makest thou? So can the clay say to the potter that fashioned him, what makest thou? Okay. Can a vase 
Say to the, the potter who made the vase, what have you formed? Can a bowl say to the potter that formed him, what have you made? That sounds foolish, right? So in like manner, the Most High is saying that mankind who was shaped with his hands from the dust of the ground, it is foolish. Excuse me. <coughs> It is foolish when we question what the Most High has made, what he has done when he formed us. And when we look at ourselves and ask, what has he formed? What has he done? Okay, that's how foolish it is. Read on. Or thy work, he hath no hands. Of his work, he hath no hands. He has no skill. Okay. He has no skill when it comes to shaping uh, pottery and, and putting things together. He's not a work master. These are things we say in our minds when we strive with the Most High. Okay? Read on. Verse 10. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Right. And that's it on that. And it goes on and on. But just showing you again how the Most High views it when we try to strive with him being not a full pot, not a full boss, but a broken boss arguing with the perfect God. Okay? Job said that if you were to contend with the Most High a thousand times, you would not win once. If you were to try to strive with the Most High a thousand times, you would not win once. Okay? That's how heavy it is when it comes to the Most High. The scripture says in the book of Corinthians that the Most High's foolish things are used to confound the wise. Okay? That's how heavy it is when it comes to the Most High and his wisdom. And his understanding and his power and us being made in the image of the Most High, trying to strive with him and question him and question his will. OK, not saying that we can't ask questions. Even the prophets ask questions. Ezra asked questions. Abraham asked questions. Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So it's not saying that we can't ask questions or inquire and things of that nature. It's when we start to get into questioning um, um, the as it says, uh, as we read in the book of Isaiah 45, where we say that the Most High has no hands. The Most High don't know what he's doing with his creation. It's when we get into that frame of mind that it becomes a problem. That's another thing for another day. Let's, uh, let's move on uh, to, uh, let's see here, let's speed it up just a little bit. Um, let's go to 2 Samuel 12 and 13. Second Samuel 12 and 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, mm. the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Right. So David, obviously we know David's sin. Okay, uh, taking Uriah's wife, um, Uriah being a righteous servant of David, David being the king, David could have had any woman in the world that he desired, yet he desired the wife of another man. Okay, so he, he uh, took the man's wife, he put the man in a position knowing that the man would die in war, and therefore went and, and, and had his wife. Okay, um, <clears throat> with that came a child. And uh, Nathan, the prophet, told David that, listen, the Most High spirit your life. The Most High has had mercy on you. However, through this act, you have given occasion for the enemies of the Most High to speak against the Most High. Therefore, even though you have been spared, I must take the life or the Most High must take the life of the child. So that the enemies of the Most High will not have an occasion to speak against him by saying that his greatest man on earth at this time being King David sinned and the Most High did absolutely nothing. What type of God is that? So to prevent that, the Most High had to execute some form of judgment, that judgment being to take the life of the child. Okay, read on. Verse 15, And Nathan departed unto his house, 
And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. So the Most High struck the child with sickness, keeping in mind that this is a child of an adulterous relationship. Okay? Read on. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted, and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? Mm. But when David saw that his servants whispered. So they were afraid to tell him that the child was dead because the way that uh, David reacted um, in mourning when he found out that the child was sick, um, they said that if we tell him that this child is gone, uh, we don't know how David is going to react. We don't know what David is going to do to himself. So they tried to, to, to hide it from him and find the best way to, to reveal this unto David. But as they spoke, David knew the way that they were communicating one, one with another that the child was gone. David understood it. Okay, go ahead. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Right. So David, once the child was gone, David rose up, washed himself, put on new raiment, and he began to eat. He broke his fast. And the question came, well, why is it when the child was alive, you mourned, but now that the child is gone, you return, uh, you return to normal? Okay, normalcy. Well, David said, uh, in fact, you can just read it and we'll break this down in relation to this lesson. Verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. Mm. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. Mm. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God be gracious to me? that the child mm. may live. Mm. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Mm. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Mm. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went unto her and lay with her, and she bare him a son. He called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Right. Yes. So <clears throat> we see David's... Uh, uh, um, David's reasoning as to why he returned and ate bread and, and uh, returned from fasting and returned from mourning, um, we see his explanation. But uh, many, again, this is one of those stories where people read it and they ask themselves, well, why would the Most High take the life of a child? Okay? And it's explained in the story better than we can explain it. Okay? This was a vile act that David committed, a righteous man lost his life for the sake of David's lust, and therefore the Most High had to bring forth judgment so that now others won't look and say that David or, or the Most High's top man on earth, who again at this time was King David, sinned against the Most High, and the Most High did absolutely nothing. An example had to be made. Okay? So he spared David's life, but he took the life of the child. Okay? The most size will be done. Okay? Many times on a smaller level, we see things happening in our current circumstances and in, in our life where we ask ourselves, well, why did the most high allow this? And you over time have heard many of these arguments and some people have found themselves so troubled with these arguments that they turn their back on the Most High, saying things such as, why does the Most High allow children to suffer and to be killed and to be abused? 
and things of that nature. But yet, people who seem to be evil and wicked seem to live out their existence, seem to live out the fullness of their lives, seem to live prosperous. And people see that, and they reason within themselves, which their reasoning is not, not necessarily a, a, a bad reasoning. However, the scriptures offer answers to those questions if you seek the scriptures earnestly you will receive answers to those questions. Okay? So, first and foremost, very quickly, let's show you that even the prophets had those questions. Uh, starting with David, going to the book of Psalms. Let me see here, which chapter is that? Where he says he sees the wicked uh, prospering. I think that's Psalm 70. Let's see. Psalm 70, I want to say 72, but I don't think that's it. Try Psalm 73. Psalm 73, verse number 3. Psalm 73 and 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, I was envious at the foolish when I seen the prosperity of the wicked. So David was angry when he saw the wicked prospering. When he saw the wicked in good health. There's another one that goes mm -hmm. in real deep on this. I can't think of it right now. But um, let's read that. Let's read that one. But there's, there's another one that goes in heavy on this, uh, on this, this, uh, this concept. As you read, I'm going to try to find it. You can go ahead and read that. Okay. Verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. It says there's no bands in their death. I think this is it. There's no bands in their death, for their strength is firm. It seems like they live out the fullness. The wicked prosper and live out the fullness of their life without sickness, without bands, without chronic illness. And they... They live off their existence and they die in peace. Read on. They are not in trouble as other men. They are not in trouble as other men. Go ahead. Neither are they plagued like other men. Neither are they plagued with other men. It doesn't seem like they go through sufferings as other men do. Read on. Therefore pride compasseth them. Therefore pride compasseth them. They are filled with pride. Pride have puffed them up. Go ahead. About as a chain. Violence cover them as a garment. Violence covers them as a garment. Go ahead. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than, than, heart, their, than heart could wish. They have more than their hearts could wish. So the same things, the same questions that we may ask ourselves in this time, looking at the wicked and, and seeing them in their prosperity and seeing them live out their existence in, in a lap of luxury. Okay. Uh, lacking absolutely nothing. We see this and we begin to question God, not realizing that a prophet of God speaks about the same thing in the scriptures. Okay, read on. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. There is no such thing as white supremacy. There is no such thing as oppression. They okay, slavery yeah. wasn't so bad. Okay, go ahead. They set their mouth against the heaven, heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. They speak against the Most High. They question his, his existence. Okay, come up with all types of fallacious arguments against the existence of Christ. They do all types of things with their mouth. Okay, speaking about the wicked. At the, at the same time, they're prospering in the earth that God made while speaking against God. Read on. Therefore his people <coughs> return hither. And waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Mm. Behold. What? Excuse is me. there knowledge in the most high? Why is God acknowledging this? Does not God see this? Does not God know that this is going on? Does not God see the works of the wicked? Does he not see their treachery? Does he not see their thievery? Does he not see their murdering? Does he not see their molestation? Does he not see their, let me say the R word, 
Does he not see this? Does not the Most High have knowledge of this? How can he be the all-seeing, the all-knowing, the omnipotent, the omniscient God and not do anything about this? Why isn't he stopping this? These are the things that we say, thinking that our reasonings are unique. Not realizing that, again, a prophet in the Bible had the same reasonings, but it didn't cause him to turn his back on God. Okay, read on. Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. It is the ungodly who prosper in the world, and we're going to explain why the ungodly prosper in the world. Read on. They increase in riches. They increase in riches. Go ahead. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. Verily, meaning truly, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Why is it that I'm seeking to cleanse my heart why is it that I'm seeking to walk the righteous path when it seems that the wicked are prospering? And he says he washed his what? And washed my hands in innocence. And he washed his hands in innocency. Meaning David is saying that, li listen, I'm looking, I'm striving for righteousness sake. I'm striving for innocency. I'm seeking salvation. I'm seeking everlasting life. I'm seeking all these things. But it looks like it's the wicked who's not seeking any, any of these things that are prospering. Why is this so? Read on. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Mm. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Mm. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. When David said he thought to know this, when he sat and he thought about this and he reasoned about this, a uh, reason concerning this is he said it was too painful for him. And for many of our people, it's too painful when we sit down and we think about this and we reason with this. So painful for some of us that we turn our back on the Most High. We turn our back on the Bible. We question whether God exists. Why would God allow this? That's what we say. Read on. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Not because of this, it was so painful that I questioned whether God existed. This was so painful that I threw away the Bible. It was so painful that I turned my back on the Most High God. That wasn't David's response. David said that this was too painful until I went into the sanctuary of God. Read on. And what did he find in the sanctuary of God? Go ahead. Then understood I their end. Then I understood their end. It looks like they're prospering. It looks like they pass on without suffering, without illness, without strain, without a care in the world. But when I went into the sanctuary of God, I truly understood their end. What is their end? Everlasting damnation. Okay? But it took David to seek the Most High to get the answer. Read on. Psalm 73 and 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest mm. them down into destruction. He says you set them in slippery places and cast them down into destruction. Speaking about the wicked. Go ahead. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Mm. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, Thou shalt despise their image. When you awake, you shall despise their image. Speaking about the image of the wicked in their prosperity. The Most High shall despise it. Read on. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. Mm. So foolish was I. David said, so foolish was I. Not, where is the Most High God? If there's a God, why is he allowing this? Throw away that Bible. Would, would God... I don't want to serve a God that would allow such things to take place on the earth. That's not David's stance. That's not the conclusion that, that David drew. David came to the conclusion that his reasoning, believing that the wicked are in prosperity, believing that they die in safety, that was foolish of him. Read on. And ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Mm. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holding me by my right hand. Now, for the sake of time, uh, two quick scriptures. 
Uh, many people ask, well, why does it seem as if they are prospering? We're looking, we turn on the TV and we see people who we would deem as evil and unrighteous people who are not seeking God. It seems like they are prospering. And it seems like those who are innocent children are suffering. Children being hit by stray bullets. Uh, uh, children being abused. Um, domestic abuse. Women being abused. Okay, men dying, men who seem as if they have done nothing wrong, yet they're, they're, they're dying, they're being killed, they're being murdered. Okay, we see these things and we question the Most High God and ask why. This doesn't seem, quote unquote, fair. Okay, why is all this going on? Why all this suffering? Why all this death? Okay, well, very, very easily, I know a lot of people may not like this answer, but here's the reality. Let's go very, very quickly to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 16. Genesis 2 and 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So as much as we would point the finger to, at God for the cases or for the cause of suffering or allowing suffering to take place, understand that the sufferings that we now see, no matter how grave and how ill they may seem, Understand that it was man who chose the suffering. Mankind chose this present suffering. Read that again. Thou shalt surely die. But of the tree of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Go of ahead. the tree of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Go ahead. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, in the day that you eat this tree, go ahead. Thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. Now. When we think of that, thou shalt surely die. What we think of is just a physical act of dying, just a physical act of death. You're going to live out your existence. You're going to live your life. And at the end of your life, you're going to die. What we don't think about is not just uh, uh, death itself, but the ways of death, the ways by which death would be brought forth. So when the Most High says, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die, is not just talking about the act of death itself, it's talking about the ways that death would be brought forth in the earth through suffering, starvation, murder, drug abuse. These are all the ways that death are brought about in the earth. And this is what entered into the stream of life when Adam disobeyed with the help of his wife disobeyed the will of God, disobeyed the commandment of God. Things started to enter into the stream of life, which we now see and recognize as suffering, uh, 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 robbery, thievery, death, uh, uh, molestation and, and abuse on all levels. We see these things and we're quick to blame God, not realizing that God warned us of everything that we see that we're suffering and told us to abstain from it. Don't touch that tree because if you touch that tree, things are going to enter into your existence that you did not bargain for. Things are going to enter into your existence that you're not to prepare, that you're not prepared to deal with. Okay. So this is why we see a world where things seem unfair, where it seems as if an innocent child loses its life in a gun battle or an innocent child is, is abused and things of that nature. We see that and we, we have questions for obvious reasons. But the answer to that question is that this is the life we chose. Or better yet, this is the death we chose. When we disobeyed, when our forefather and foremother disobeyed the will of God. Okay, let's get very quickly Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2 and verse number 23. Okay. 
Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2, verse 23 through 24. And then we'll just go through a few more scriptures and uh, end today's lesson. Okay? Wisdom of Solomon 2 and 23. For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. So this is what God desired. This was God's will for mankind. This is what God initially desired for mankind, not the present sufferings that we now see, not the ways of death that we now suffer. This was not God's will. His will was that we would have life, and not only that we would have life, but that we would have it more abundantly. That was his will. His will is that we would be rulers of all things that he created for our service, all things that he created for our enjoyment, all things that he created for our use, it was his will that we would have dominion over these things. But instead, we chose to serve the things over which God gave us dominion. Okay? So it's not the most high's fault. As much as we would say, why won't he stop it? Well, why did we start it is the question. Okay, read on. Verse 24, nevertheless, through envy of the devil. Through what? Through envy of the devil. Nevertheless, meaning but, through envy of the devil. However, through envy of the devil, go in. Came death into the world. Came death into the world. Someone at some point envied the devil, and therefore, through envy of the devil, death came into the world. It's not by the Most High's doing. He didn't choose this for us. We chose this for us. Read on. And they that do hold of his side do find it. And they that do hold to his side do find it. Meaning they who hold to the side of the devil and his ways, his works, do find it. And the reality is this. Getting back to the point, many times we ask ourselves, why does it seem as if the innocent are suffering? Well, <laughs> the same way in David's case, it was by his wrongdoing that death entered into his stream of life with that child losing its life. The case is so for many of us. When we look at our communities and we ask ourselves, why are all these things being allowed? One thing we don't question or one thing we don't bring into question is the fact that uh, there's many things we do in our communities that are, are totally against the will of the Most High God, totally against the commandments of the Most High God. And therefore, it opens the floodgates for forces, unseen forces, demonic forces to enter into the stream of our community. And now things which seem unfair become open game. Okay, you start to see the suffering of children. You start to see children being abused and losing their lives and grandmothers sitting on the stoop losing their lives and things of that nature. Why? Because there's many things going on in our communities that are totally against the will of God. That we enjoy. That we, not only do we allow it, we enjoy these things. But now when the results start to manifest itself, then we start asking, why, why, why? Why is God allowing this? Why, why, why? And the question is, why not? You're inviting these things into your existence. Okay, but that's another thing for another day, right? Um, let's go to the book of, uh, let's get two more scriptures and then we'll close out. Uh, let's see here. Two more scriptures and then we'll close out. Okay, let's get Lamentations 3.17. The book of Lamentations 3 and 17. And thou hast removed my soul far from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. 
This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, mm. because his compassions fail not. And that is the reason why we have not been consumed, though we live daily, in many cases, operating against the will of God doing things that are against the will of God, doing things that are outright against his commandments, yet we're still here. Okay? Why? Because it is of his mercy. It is of his mercy that we're not consumed. Okay? Many of the things that we've suffered in this captivity as a result of the sins of our forefathers. We should have been dead by now. We should have been wiped out as a nation by this point, yet it is through the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. We tell ourselves that we're just so strong, we're just so great of a people that nothing can stop us, nothing can overtake us. Well, I, I hate to say it, but I, I don't think that that's the case. Any other nation suffering these things would have perished. But it is through the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Okay? It is of his mercies that we are not consumed. We should be wiped out. We should not be in existence right now. But because of his mercy, we are not consumed. Read on. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Therefore will I hope in him. Go ahead. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. So the Most High is good unto them that wait for for him. <coughs> Go ahead. To the soul that seeketh him. Mm -hmm. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Mm -hmm. It is good for Excuse a man me. that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. All right, let's go to Ecclesiastes, last scripture, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Many people ask, well, what is the will of God for us? Well, it starts here. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Mm -hmm. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. Go ahead. For this is the whole duty of man. For this is the whole duty of man. So if you want to know what the will of God is for us, it starts here. Fear him and keep his his commandments. This is our duty, and this is where the will of God begins for our lives. Read on. For God shall bring every, excuse me, every work into judgment. Why? Because we understand that every work will be brought into judgment. Okay? The good and the bad will be brought into judgment. Read on. With every secret thing. With every secret thing. Even the things we think no one sees. The things we think the Most High don't see. That the Most High is not concerned with. Because we feel that we're so small in this universe. Why would the Most High care about little old us? When the reality is that we are the center of most the Most High's creation. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Okay? We are the purpose of of his creation. So therefore, a magnifying glass, a spiritual magnifying glass is upon us, watching us every moment. Okay? So yes, even the secret things, the things that we think no one knows, will be brought out openly in judgment. Read on. Whether it be good. Whether it be good. Or whether it be evil. Or whether it be evil. So it behooves us to fulfill the will of God for our lives by starting at this point of fearing him and keeping his commandments. Okay? Now with that, I say blessings and shalom. We're going to conclude here. For those who are in the academy, we are going into week number five. So for those who are not in the academy, there's still time if you would like to enroll. But in tomorrow's academy lesson, we're going to be dealing with uh, the split between Israel and Judah dealing with the history of Israel and how we develop a kingship. We did not always have a kingship, but that came in over time. And we're going to explain how that came to be, how that really part of that uh, resulted in the fall of the nation and the destruction of the nation, but also 
how did that kingship and some of the things that befell us under that kingship, how does that play out in the gospel, in the New Testament, in the, the mission of the gospel? And who was the gospel being taught to in the New Testament um, and uh, as a result of some of the things that resulted in the Old Testament with the fall and the split of the nation? So with that, I want to say bless you all and shalom. Um, you all enjoy the rest of your Sabbaths. And until next time, stay safe. Bless you all and shalom.